As we get ready to jump into the word, I want to invite you to pause with me and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to ask that your spirit would fill our presence, would fill our mind, would fill our soul as we get ready to jump into the word. Father, I pray that you would silence the worries and the distractions and everything that's pulling us away from this moment. Father, I pray for a special shroud of protection around my friends who are watching or who are listening, that you would keep the evil one away for the moment so that we would be receptive to hear your word. We thank you in advance for your grace and for your goodness. And we ask that you would use this time to continue to form us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're finally coming to the end of our sermon series, Access. We've been in this series this entire month, and we've really been looking at this story of Jesus' temptations in the wilderness. Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days um, in a time of solitude and a time of prayer to connect with his heavenly Father, to get ready for the journey that awaited him. And what we find is that while Jesus was making this time to, to really connect with his heavenly Father, that it was in that moment that the enemy comes to try to attack him. And what we've seen so far is that Jesus is able to overcome the first two temptations without a problem. And what we find is that Jesus uses tools and at his disposal that weren't just there for him. But that the, the, the power that Jesus had was rooted in the access that we also have today in the power of the Spirit. So Jesus was able to overcome temptations because of the power of the Spirit, because of the power of the Word, and because of the power of prayer. Now, none of those things were reserved only for Jesus. But in fact, we have access to those same things today. And I think that the reason that this story is in the Bible, really all of the stories of Jesus over the three and a half years of his adult ministry, that the reason that they're there is to show us today what it looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. What it looks like for us to, to live our lives modeled and oriented on the life of Jesus. Because if Jesus just comes to die, he could have just descended from heaven, died on the cross, and ascended back to heaven. But God had a deeper plan, which was to show you and me how to live, how to have an abundant life, even if everything isn't going perfectly. Even if we're going through moments of hardship, even if the deliverance um, is delayed, that we could still have faith and a flourishing life. Life. So today we're going to look at the third temptation of Jesus, and um, I'm going to just jump in. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. The Bible says, And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written that he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, it's interesting that the devil begins this third and final temptation by literally quoting scripture. But here's what happens. The devil, like every villain we've ever seen in any film, they always adapt they always evolve. They always change up their tactics to hopefully be able to overcome the protagonist in the story. And, and that's what the devil is doing here. And that's what he does in our lives. He tries to learn to see, all right, here's your strength. Jesus' strength was in the word. So what can I do to take that strength away from Jesus? Because after the first two temptations, Jesus doesn't get into a... Um, philosophical or intellectual or ethical discussion with the devil. He doesn't have a Bible study with him and gives him 10 Bible verses. All Jesus does is quote scripture once because for Jesus, there is power in the word of God. There is power in the word of God. That is why it is essential if you want to have a faith that is fortified, if you want to have a faith that flourishes, it is essential for you to have a foundation in the Word. 
And so part of the temptations and part of the triumph of Jesus over the testing and the temptation is by spending time in the Word because there's power in the Word. So the devil, like every good villain, he says, I'm going to take that away from him. Every good debater will try to take your greatest argument and use it before you can use it and then deconstruct it. So that's what the devil was doing. And the devil quotes Psalm 91. And many of you, if you've been in the church long enough, you know what Psalm 91 is. Psalm 91 is that passage that we read when we're home alone in the middle of the night and we hear creaks and in the house and you hear a noise in the house and you go to, maybe it's just me, Psalm 91. It's it's what I used to read whenever I would get on an airplane years ago and I would pull out my Bible and I would read Psalm 91. I'm not afraid of flying, but like there's always that little hint of fear. And you know, you would read Psalm 91 when I visited church members here in our church at the hospital. And, and over the last 15 years, the Psalm 91 is, is that passage that I go to to help people to have strength, to help people to have courage, to, to show people that God is still working on their behalf. And so the devil uses Psalm 91, verse 11 to 12. Say, listen, Jesus, you're on the highest point here in Jerusalem. Just throw yourself down. God's going to protect you. God's going to send his angels. God's not going to let the Messiah die before his time. But instead of Jesus retorting with some kind of argument, with some kind of intellectual argument, or he doesn't just post on Facebook, which inevitably those Facebook posts, people are just posting what they believe and there's no real conversation. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus simply points back to the word. You know what the devil was doing here was trying to get Jesus to doubt that God had the power to protect him. The devil was trying to get Jesus to lose trust in the power of his heavenly father. The devil was literally calling into question the character of God. Because the devil knew, like, listen, if I tempt Jesus and Jesus throws himself down, like, God's not going to negotiate with me, right? Like, we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? Like, like the devil is the terrorist and God's not going to negotiate. God's not going to, his will will not be bent by what the devil wants or doesn't want. And so the devil knew that God's like, God's not going to negotiate with me. So if I can just get Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple, and if God doesn't do anything, then I win. Because the devil is always trying to win. But Jesus is like, yo, calm down, devil. Like, you can't steal my, you can't steal my soundtrack. Like, that's my jam. So, you know, growing up, uh, my sister, who's about a year older than me, um, whenever her favorite song would come on on the radio while we were driving in the car, she would say, that's my song. And then she would sing along with it. Uh, to which I would turn the radio knob a little bit louder to drown her voice out. There's nothing wrong with her voice, and um, but I wanted to hear the artist sing. And then the next good song would come on, and she was like, that's my song. Same thing. She would sing, and I would turn it up. The next song would come up, that's my song. I'm like, then I would just turn the radio off and be like, you got to leave some for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I have to apologize, I think, to all of my siblings for being me, the, the annoying youngest of four. But you know, like the devil was trying to take Jesus' greatest hits, his songs, his soundtracks. Like, like the devil was trying to take Jesus' words and try to distort them. And by doing so, he was trying to distort and call into question the character of God. And I know we look at this and we think to ourselves, man, devil, you ain't ever going to question the character of God. But I think sometimes, without knowing it, we question the character of God. If you've ever been going through a prolonged period of time where things just aren't going well, right? you're not getting any better, your family member isn't getting any better, the treatment isn't working, where, where you go through a prolonged period of time where... like. It seems like the whole world is conspiring against you. Then it's really easy for that delay to make you begin to doubt whether God will deliver you. That sometimes in the delay, we begin to doubt that the deliverance of God is coming. And sometimes when we begin to doubt, 
When we begin to think that, hey, maybe God's not going to step in right now. When we begin to think that maybe God's not going to do anything for us, what ends up happening is we then call into question the character, the goodness, the mercy, and the blessing of God. Because all the devil wants us to do is to begin to doubt. He doesn't need us to stop believing in God. He just needs us to doubt long enough. He just needs a window, a crack, to begin to tear down the image of God in our minds. And that's what was happening here. He just wanted Jesus to crack. He just wanted his faith to crack. And so he goes to Psalm 91. But here's the problem, fam, that the devil quoted the wrong part of Psalm 91. For those of you that know Psalm 91 and for those of you that don't, I want to read verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. See, the devil was saying, look, if if God doesn't protect you, he's not a God at all. If God delays too long in delivering you, how can you even trust him? But the reason that Jesus had complete trust in his heavenly father was that he didn't start Psalm 91 in verse 11. He started Psalm 91 in verse 1 that promises that he who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty will rest in the shadow of his presence. And he will say of the Lord, my God is my refuge, my fortress, in him I trust. See, the reason that Jesus is able to triumph over this temptation and this test is because his trust was in God. That Jesus' trust was that he could seek refuge and fortress and safety in the presence of God. We've already seen in this temptation that it doesn't matter if Jesus was hungry. It doesn't matter if Jesus is is about to go in three and a half years of a difficult life ahead of him. None of that mattered because Jesus had the presence of God. Jesus had trust in God. But you see, the, the devil was just trying to test the character of God. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these cooking shows, specifically with Chef Ramsay. Chef Ramsay is notorious for going to different kitchens and different chefs, and they prepare food for him. And then he uses language that I could never use uh, in real life, but also not in a sermon. But he uses language to, dis- to discuss how disgusting and terrible that food is. He's literally going to test their food. But here's what happens when we test things. When we're testing something, we're trying to find the fault in it. When you take a test at school, it's almost like they want to know what you don't know, right? They're testing you to see where you're going to fail. And that's what the devil was doing. He was just trying to get Jesus' faith to fail. But in any healthy relationship, you don't test one another. In a healthy marriage, you don't test each other to see if you love each other. That's called manipulation. That's what the devil was trying to do with, with God and with Jesus. He was trying to manipulate Jesus against God. He was trying to set up God to fail, but Jesus would not fall for that trick. Jesus would not fall for that test because he kept going back to Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, that he would make God his refuge In the moments when you feel the test of life coming your way, in the moments when you feel like you don't have the strength to triumph over your temptation, I want you to seek the presence of God. Seek the shelter in God's presence. Seek refuge in the presence of God. Go to Him for safety because He will give you the power to triumph over the test. He will give you the power to triumph over the test. So when you find yourself being tested, I want you to think of Psalm 34, verse 8. See, the way that you overcome these moments of testing and temptation in your life is to taste the goodness of God. And that's what Jesus did. He he went into the wilderness 
to get ready for the journey that waited ahead of him. He went into the wilderness to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Word, to be filled with prayer, because he knew that the journey that awaited him was going to be difficult. And so Jesus could overcome these temptations. Jesus could overcome a difficult life that he was about to encounter because he had tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When your trust is wavering, when your doubt is increasing, the deliverance is too delayed, taste and see that the Lord is good. In those moments when you feel helpless, in the moments when you feel hopeless, in the moments when you feel like there is no deliverance coming, in those moments, instead of slipping into the cynicism and the doubt and the fear, in that moment, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because you will be blessed if you can trust in God. So the devil uses God's word against Jesus and Jesus simply has another word for him. And he says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Instead, taste and see that the Lord is good. So I want to I read from Exodus chapter 17. And the reason that I want to read from Exodus 17 is because that's what Jesus is referring to. Jesus is referring to a very specific story that happened in Exodus 17. And I'm going to read from verse 1. And, and to set this up before I start reading... The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt. God sends Moses to be the one to help and rescue them from Egyptian slavery. They're on the run for their lives. God parts the Red Sea. The Israelites cross through it. They come to the other side. And before the Egyptian military, which was the strongest world superpower of the day, before they could get to the other side, the waters come and wash them away. And then the Israelites, you would think, are like, whew. We made it. Instead of being grateful, instead of being thankful, what the Bible tells us is they start grumbling and quarreling against the Lord. They're mad because they don't have enough food to eat. They're mad because they don't have enough water to drink. They're mad because they don't have shelter. Now, here's the thing. God, when he rescues them, he promises that he is going to lead them through the wilderness. But when they get to the other side of the wilderness... God has a special land that they called the promised land that was flowing with everything they would need. Where once they were slaves, now they would be free. Where once they owned nothing, now they would have all of the lavish accoutrements that they could ever desire. Where once they were simply brick-making animals, now they would have all that their hearts desired and so much more. Where once they weren't a people, now they are going to be a nation and a people that would bless the world. God says, I have this for you. But I got to take you on a journey first. It tells us that the Israelites wandered in the desert. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But had there been a GPS back then, it would have only taken them days to go from Egypt to Canaan. So I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. The Bible tells us that God led them by stages. God had to lead them from stage to stage in this journey because God was needing to, to grow their faith. God was needing to grow and increase their trust. Now, it's interesting because if, if I, and, I, and I'm looking back and I'm being a commentary of history, if I was there when Israel was rescued from Egypt, if I had seen all of those plagues, if I had seen all of the wonders and the miracles that God did to get the Israelites out of Egypt, I, I would, wherever God tells me to go, I'm going to go. God, you, you want me to cross this water, but the water isn't part? I'm there. God, I've seen what you've done. 
I am going to trust you with my present because I know that you have a future in store for me that I could never have imagined. So I am going to trust you. Even though there is a delay in the deliverance, I am going to trust you with my destiny. But these people couldn't. They didn't trust God enough. It's as though they had forgotten all of the goodness and all of the miracles and all of the blessings that God had given them. And so it says that they had to journey in stages. Another way of saying this is God took them the roundabout way. God had to lead them in circles because it was taking them that long to learn the lessons that God was wanting them to learn so that they could then step into the destiny that God had designed for them, which was to be a nation that would bless the world. But they were slow in learning. You know, it's interesting if you have kids, and if you don't, I think you can understand this, but... You know, our daughter, Everly, is two and a half years old and she's having so many different experiences. She goes to school one day a week and she's making new friends. And my wife and I will just sit back sometimes and just watch her as she's talking and she's telling us about her day. And and we just like look at each other sometimes and say, doesn't she seem like such a different person? And that's because she's growing. She's, She's going through the different stages of growth in her life. And I think that God does that for the Israelites as they wandered or as they were led through the desert, is that God was leading them from one stage to another as they were ready to go and grow their faith. And that's true for our faith, for our relationship with Jesus, is that that God takes us from stage to stage, and every stage we go to, our faith grows. But sometimes what we find in scriptures is you got to learn the same lesson more than once. Because there are times in our lives where we might learn a lesson, but we easily forget. There are times in our lives where where God thinks we should have learned a lesson, but we don't. And then we find ourselves back in the same place. And God's just like, (sighs) all right, let's do this again. Right? If you've ever played sports, You'll know the annoying coach that tells you to run it again, run it again, run it again until you get it right. And that's what was happening to the Israelites in the desert. God was leading them through stages until they could get the lesson they were needing to learn. Verse 2. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? You know, it's interesting. It says that they quarreled. They couldn't accept that God was still leading them. They couldn't allow God to lead them. What they wanted is that they wanted to lead God. In our relationship with God, in your relationship with God, you don't lead, you follow. We don't lead God in our relationship. God leads us. And I got to tell you that that's a lesson that sometimes we have to learn time and time and time again. When, when the devil was trying to question God's character, we sometimes question God's character ourselves when we can't trust God's plan for our lives. We question God's character when we can't submit and surrender to the path that God has already created for us. We question the goodness and the character of God when we say things like, God, look, if you just get me out of this thing, then I will. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've had that prayer in my life. God, if you do this, this one time, then I will change this in my life. If you do this, then I will give that up. If you change this, if you take this away, if you fix this problem, then I will never do it again. And we begin to question God's character when we do that because God's like, look, I'm not going to make a deal with you like this. I don't negotiate with terrorists. (laughs) Sometimes we're the terrorists in our relationship with God. 
Sometimes we question the goodness and the character of God when we tell God how things should be, when what we should be doing is simply listening to the Word of God. And so the Israelites quarreled. They complained, God, you're delaying too long to deliver us. God, you're delaying too long to get us to our destiny. God, you're making promises I don't think you're going to keep. And so they quarreled with Moses. And Moses says, why do you put the Lord your God to the test? Just wait. Just be patient. You know, if I was Moses, I would have said, like, did you not complain about food and God rained down manna? Like, as far as we know, God was still raining down manna to them. Every single day from the heavens, manna would come down to feed the Israelites a bread-like substance so that they wouldn't starve to death. And yet they're complaining because they don't have food. They're complaining because they've already started taking for granted the blessings that God has been blessing them with. The manna that was keeping them alive through the power of God, they were now taking for granted. And what ends up happening in our life of faith is that the moment we start taking God's blessings and mercies for granted is the moment that we stop trusting in God. That is why gratitude is essential to your life of faith. That's why we need to continually be grateful and thankful for all of the blessings that God is giving us. And I know some of you might be thinking to yourselves, oh, come on, like there's so much bad that's going on in my life. God's not blessing me. But it's like, you know, if you have, you have air in your lungs, you're waking up in the morning, you're able to walk, you're able to talk, you're able to communicate, you're able to live another day, that sounds like a blessing to me. The Israelites were in the wilderness. It was far from perfect. The Israelites were literally in a desert, in the wilderness, wandering around for 40 days. They delayed because they couldn't believe that deliverance was coming. And so you may be going through something in your life that's difficult. And some of you, for some of you, life is going so great, but there's danger even when life is going well to simply take for granted all that God has been giving you. So the Israelites, they, they complained. They put their Lord, their God, to the test. Verse 9, So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people. Take some of the elders of Israel with you, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Moses says, what am I going to do, God? What, 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 what do you want me to do? It seems like it's, it's episode after episode, uh, journey after journey, stage after stage that these people keep coming after me. And God, I trust you. I love you. I've seen you face to face, but there's only so much a human can withstand. And I think the devil was, was thinking the very same thing, that there's only so much that Jesus can withstand. There's only so much that he can withstand because he is famished. He is hungry. But it's in that moment when the Israelites were saying, is God among us or not? Like, yo, God, you're, you're, I'm going to say this again. You're delaying in the deliverance. And God says, just, can you just trust me and go at my pace? Just trust me and follow where I lead. Just trust me. And so God tells Moses, listen, go on ahead of the people you go do you god was saying moses do you believe me do you believe that i can deliver do you believe that i still have power to bring down blessings do you believe that i still have the ability to manifest miracles in your presence do you believe so god says moses you go ahead of the people you go so that they will follow you and then god says take the take the rod the rod was Moses' rod. It was the shepherd's rod. And it was the very same rod where, where Moses had hit another rock earlier and water came out. 
It was the same rod that Moses would dip into the river so that the waters were part. It was the same rod that even though it was Moses's, it was really the power of God that was manifested through it. So he says, Moses, do you have faith? Will you trust me? You go on ahead. Take the rod from which you have already seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And then God says, and I will go ahead of you and I will be standing on the rock of Horeb. I will go ahead of you and meet you there. See, because for Moses, this was one of those moments in his journey where he now had to show God whether he would trust him and entrust his life to him, whether he would seek God as his fortress and as his strength. He had already tasted and seen that the Lord was good and God was again asking him, will you trust me one more time? Will you trust me one more time? Will you trust me for the thing you're going through right now? Trust me, Moses. I will go ahead of you and I will meet you there. God had set up a divine appointment between him and Moses. While the Israelites and Moses, I believe, were dismayed in the delay of deliverance, God had set up a divine appointment to show the Israelites again that he still had the power to deliver. They wanted to know, is God still among us? The devil didn't believe that God was still among Jesus and in those 40 days in the wilderness because he wanted to make Jesus stumble. He wanted to make Jesus fall. He wanted to make Jesus question the goodness and the integrity of the character of God. But Jesus would not be overcome by those temptations because his trust in God was greater than the test that was in front of him. His trust in God is what helped him to overcome the temptation because Jesus had tasted and seen that the Lord is indeed good. And when you have tasted to see that the Lord is good, you will have the power and the strength to overcome even the greatest of the testimony of the test and the temptations in your life because now you go in the power of the one who goes ahead of you and waits for you in the moment of your greatest testing. I don't know what your Mount Horeb is today. I don't know the journey of the stage and faith where you are today, but God is going before you. God is going before you. He's asking you to trust him, to meet him where God already is. Can you go at the pace of God? Can you entrust yourself to God? Stop questioning whether God will deliver. Stop questioning when God will deliver. Quit questioning how quickly God must deliver. Simply trust. Simply taste and see that God is good. For those who taste and see that God is good, blessed will you be. God delivers in God's timing. God just wants you to be faithful right now. God just wants you to be faithful in the stage of the journey that you're going through. Jesus overcomes the temptations of the devil to show us how to overcome. Jesus overcomes the temptations and the testing of the devil to be a pioneer and a perfecter of how to walk this world so that he could leave a path for us to follow because God is always going ahead of us. God is always going ahead of us. God is always leading. And today, some of you have to stop trying to lead God and instead simply trust that God is leading and where God leads, you will follow. And there's going to be times where you have to learn that lesson over and over and over again. But as you, listen, as you grow and as you learn, and as your faith flourishes, you're going to be blessed. You're going to see the goodness of the glory of God. You will see what it feels and experience what it's like to seek refuge in the strength and in the fortress of God's presence.
So as we come to the close of today's message, in the moments when your trust is waning, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you truly are good above all measure. My prayer for those who are watching and listening to this message, God, help us to trust you better. God, help us to surrender ourselves to you. God, help us to stop questioning your character and simply trust you today. For those who haven't tasted to see that you are good, Father, give them that opportunity. Lead them in an experience that they will see the goodness of your mercy in their lives. And for those of us who have been in this our entire lives, keep reminding us of your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining and tuning in with us today. If today was a blessing for you, we invite you to do three things. The first thing is to create a space for you here at Baldwinbrook Church. So subscribe to this channel and follow us and join us every single week as we have new messages and new content just for you. The second thing is to help create a space for people around you. Go ahead and share this video with your friends, with your family, coworkers, neighbors, anyone that you think would benefit from this message today. And lastly, if you have benefited from anything that's happening here at Bolingbrook Church, we invite you to pray, to partner with us with your giving and your resources in helping us create spaces for people all around the world. We really hope that you feel called and are willing. And if you are, go ahead and click on the giving description below because we have a special vision and mission here at Bolingbrook Church, and that is to create spaces for the people that God missed the most. And as a follower of Christ, I believe that you are a space creator too. So we hope that you continue to join our community and help create spaces where you are. Thank you for being a space creator.